My name is Jeffrey Paul. I'm president of the Congregation Albert Brotherhood. I want to welcome all of you this morning to our Secretary of State debate. A little history, we've been doing these debates for about 50 years. We're not sure exactly how many, but an awful long time. Um, first of all, I want to remind you that if you didn't pick one up and would like one, the League of Women Voters Voters Guide is available at the front, uh, in the front lobby. Uh, there's a table, they will be out there. When you came in, you also probably noticed, hopefully, a couple of little buckets that say donation. And if you'd like to drop off a donation in there on your way out, that would be great. That would help us with all of the different community service projects we do, including the uh, debates. If you have a cell phone, we'd like you to make sure it's on vibrate. We don't want any cell phones going off. That was mostly for my benefit. Um, we'll ask, I don't think anybody did, but if you brought any signs in of any kind, they um, are not allowed. So if you have a sign, please sit on it. Or otherwise, if you, if you do have one and you raise it, um, it'll be your, your last thing you do in the debate today, because you'll, you'll be escorted out. So the only signs we allowed are Charlie's Timer signs. Other than that, please leave them unused. Um, we are not doing any live broadcast of the event today. We do have some folks here that'll be doing some replays later, or just, uh, I know we have um, at least one TV station here, but that'll be on the news, hope, I hope, um, but not live broadcasted. Our moderator is Ken Waltz, the editor in chief of the Albuquerque Journal who has done uh, several of these for us before and done a wonderful job. The way the debate's gonna run, we'll do two minute opening and they'll have a two minute closing. Questions in between will be 90 seconds to respond. If there's a follow up to that question or if they wanna do a rebuttal, if you wanna call it that, they'll have 60 seconds, okay? Questions are coming from the brunch crowd. If all the questions are gone, we can take questions from the audience, and our moderator will have the opportunity, if he so desires, to ask additional questions or follow up. We're planning for one hour. At the end of the hour, if there are more questions, if the moderator and candidates want to take more questions, that will be up to them, and that, that's if the three on their schedule can stay a little longer, but we're certainly not going to um, have them do that because I'm sure they have tight schedules today. So we'd like to have our candidates come up, Nora Espinoza and Maggie Toulouse Oliver. Thank you. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Kent. We'll let them make sure their lapel mics are working fine. And it's all yours, Kent. Thank you again.
make a minor adjustment here. Let's go ahead and try to get started here. Um, Great. I didn't break it. They didn't break it. <laughs> so we're, we're all innocent at this point. Uh, today's yeah. as Jeffrey mentioned, all the questions came from people participating in breakfast. They were now screened by leaders of the congregation on the board. Uh, questions were screened for uh, appropriateness, stability, issues that both candidates could respond to and issues that are related to, to the office itself. Uh, each candidate will have two minutes for an opening statement. The order of openings and closings will be determined by draw before, uh, before we can hear and put down the mics. I don't know who that one is. It's out there. Uh, it's. <laughs> uh, the organizers has, have asked, in addition to no signs, that if you have applause, wait till the end. Uh, this is, has a long history of being a civil and productive discussion of issues and candidate resumes, and we'd like to continue in that great tradition. Uh, and so we will start with opening statements, and by draw, Maggie Toulouse Oliver goes first. Testing, testing. Okay. Maggie, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Waltz. Thank you all of you for being here today to the Brotherhood for a wonderful brunch this morning and to Congregation Albert. I'm very grateful to be here with you this morning. My name is Maggie Toulouse Oliver. I have served as the county clerk of this county for the last nearly 10 years and I am running to be your next Secretary of State here in New Mexico. Um, the reason that we are even having an election for Secretary of State in New Mexico is, I think, the biggest issue of this campaign this year. Unfortunately, we had a Secretary of State who was uh, entrusted with upholding the highest ethical standards for every elected official uh, up and down the ballot here in New Mexico, and she unfortunately violated those very laws and ethics which she was charged with uh, upholding, and as a result, uh, had to resign the office. So we are having an election this year. I believe the key issue is to restore integrity, transparency, and trust in the Secretary of State's office. I've worked for almost 10 years now as the county clerk in the largest county of this state, overseeing elections, expanding access to the ballot box, and working to ensure transparency and fair elections. And I'm taking those skills with me to Santa Fe because I believe that our democracy is only at its best when we have as full and robust participation as we can possibly have in our democratic process. Voting is the cornerstone of our democracy and great participation in our elections is absolutely essential to not only ensuring that our democracy survives but continues to thrive over the long term. That's why I'm running for your Secretary of State and I appreciate being here today to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for having me. I'm Nora Espinosa. I'm an educator, 
been an educator for 22 years, small business owner, and I have a long, uh, many years of administration experience. The reason I'm running, let me share with you. When I realized that the same candidate that the voters rejected in 2014 is the same candidate running who does not believe in the integrity of the process, who does not believe in voter ID. I have just heard uh, very clearly of um, we must have a robust uh, system, but how is this system? Is the most important thing just signing anybody, registering anybody, whether they are U.S. citizens or not U.S. citizens, or have green cards or not, so that we can fill the ballots and so that they can vote, and yet this system, this sanctity of each individual vote not be protected? I am running because I believe in the sanctity of each individual vote, that not one vote should be stolen, not one person disenfranchised. And that is why I'm running. I am running to make sure that we have honest, fair elections. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our question, our audience questions now, and we will start with Ms. Toulouse Oliver. And under the, the format rules, uh, there's a 90-second response each candidate will have, and then each candidate, should they wish to do a follow, will have 60 seconds. Then we will rotate order of answers. So, Ms. Toulouse Oliver, this goes to you first. What are the two or three primary jobs of Secretary of State, and outline your experience and planning, training that would allow you to succeed in this position? Sure, well, thank you very much for the question. Um, the three main objectives of the Secretary of State's office that it is, in char it is charged with overseeing are, first and foremost, the oversight of elections in the state of New Mexico. The Secretary of State is the chief elections officer for the state of New Mexico. And in that regard, I bring nearly 10 years of experience as the chief elections officer of the largest county in the state. Uh, I'm currently running my fifth general election here in Bernalillo County. Over the last 10 years, we have drastically improved, modernized the election system and made it easier and more accessible for every voter to cast a ballot. The Secretary of State is also the Chief Ethics Officer for the State of New Mexico and is charged with ensuring that all of our uh, ethics rules and, uh, well, all of our ethics laws are being upheld. In fact, the Secretary of State oversees our campaign finance laws as well as ensuring that elected officials at all levels of government are complying with the governmental code of conduct. Um, in my experience as county clerk, it has been very necessary over the years to ensure fair election processes. So I have a, a vast amount of experience in upholding these ethical standards in Bernalillo County. Finally, the Secretary of State, of course, oversees the Business Services Division and the Corporations Bureau, recording and ensuring that business licenses are able to be obtained in a quick and timely manner, which we do in the Land Records Office uh, within the County Clerk's Office as well. Thank you. Ms. Espinosa? Yes. Um, as was stated earlier, um, yes, we are to make sure that we have honest and fair elections. But how can you have honest and fair elections when you don't have voter ID? At this point, my opponent, Lechuga Tena, who was an illegal citizen, and her, um, Miss, my opponent, was the one registered Lechuga Tena, who voted. And ladies and gentlemen, the most important thing that needs to be realized is once you vote, that vote cannot be returned. That vote counts, whether they're illegal or not. So I think it's very important that we have voter ID. Code of conduct, my opponent, my opponent campaign manager is on the board of the code of conduct. So that means if anybody comes and does a complaint, the grievance board against anything, he's on that board. And we also have, you talk about ethics and transparency, my opponent's treasurer is the treasurer of six other PACs. So here we have the money pack to pack to pack. And um, so when it comes to what our responsibilities are, that was stated very clearly. But I think the strong difference here is really what is transparency, what is honesty and integrity. That is the issue. And who is going to be focused on the administration of this office and not be a political animal. Ms. Toulouse Oliver, would you like to follow? 
Well, um, I think it's extremely telling that my opponent didn't answer the question. And instead, she launched a completely unwarranted attack on me for an issue that hasn't even been raised yet in this debate, although I'm, I'm sure that it will be because it's something that uh, folks do like to talk about in regard to this office. What I can say is that, unfortunately, the level of discourse in this campaign, I think, was just demonstrated by my opponent. It's really important that we talk about what we bring to the table when running for Secretary of State. This is the third highest office in the state of New Mexico, and it has unfortunately been left to languish for years. We have not had a strong example of how to well administer the Secretary of State's office. Um, unfortunately, my opponent has decided to hire uh, the former campaign manager of the former Secretary of State and somebody who worked in that office, if, if we're gonna talk about campaign managers, and led the, uh, the efforts of the former Secretary of State to make it harder for New Mexicans to vote. Um, so we do see very differently on that issue. I'm sure we'll continue to talk about it. But in this office, experience really matters. And I'm the only candidate that has the experience that we need to restore integrity and transparency to the Secretary of State's office. Ms. Espinosa, would you like to elaborate? Yes. Here again, integrity. Common Cause stated that to go pack to pack and not be transparent with your uh, treasure or with um, being hired, you know, uh, on her campaign finance. My opponent didn't even report on her campaign finance that she's hired by UNM. These are not tactics. Tactics. The voters must decide who is going to be focused on the process, who is truly going to be protecting each individual vote. That's what's it. Whether you're a Republican or Democrat or Independent, that is why I am not out there campaigning for anyone. I do want Hillary to vote for anyone that supports Hillary. I want you to vote for me. Simply because my focus, I want everyone, every legitimate vote, anyone that can vote legitimately, to vote for me. Because my focus actually is on the sanctity of each individual vote to protect your vote. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next question, and Ms. Espinosa will answer first. Are you in favor of voting online? And talk about that issue. Sure. Well, there has been um, a lot of problems with voting online. Um, there's been a lot of hacking. I cannot say that in the future it would not be something that we could look into, but presently, due to technology, um, it would not be something that I would race and do as Secretary of State. I think the focus needs to be that we need to clean up our roles. I know that my opponent thinks, wow, this great technology of the barcode, but yet we had Polito, a gentleman who received three of these. That means you go, and these two of them were people that lived in his residence 11 years ago. Then we had a restaurant that received 25, 25. And there's no voter ID, ladies and gentlemen, so anyone can take these and vote. The issue is protecting each one of you, whether you're a Republican, Democrat, or Independent, to protect your vote. Thank you. Ms. Luz Oliver. Thank you. So in regard to the question regarding whether or not we should have online voting, um, this is something that I have been working with a variety of national organizations on uh, for years. A lot of people would like to see online voting the way that we do so many other things online nowadays. But I have to tell you, in my experience working with organizations such as the Election Verification Network and other groups that have been looking into how can we do something like online voting in a way that's safe, in a way that is uh, not able to be hacked, in a way that prevents some sort of interference with the election process. A lot of people, a lot of incredibly smart people have looked into this issue and unfortunately we're not there yet. We're not there yet technologically. What we have in New Mexico is really great. We have a paper ballot system and we do count those paper ballots with electronic tabulators, but we have wonderful post-election processes such as automatic recounts and such as the uh, required mandatory post-election audit that allow us to make sure that those ballots were counted as cast in order to verify the outcome. So we are not there yet technologically for online voting, but we may be someday. Would you care to elaborate, Ms. Espinosa? Well, the only thing that I really would like to focus on um, is when she said the election ver um, verification. And I know this is a, a bill that you can go and, and, and secure the elections or verify who the person is that is voting and clean up the rolls. And 
to send out, this is, this is my issue, ladies and gentlemen, that this barcode that was sent out, this letter that was sent out that others are receiving several, the number one thing that a Secretary of State must do is clean the rolls. Those that have died, those that have green cards, those that are ineligible to vote. That's the number one priority. You don't take these great ideas, not follow the law, and send them out there. That's my issue. We must follow the law and do what is right first before we start doing, uh, think these are great ideas. Thank you. Thank you. We do have an audience question regarding the barcodes, so let's go directly to that, and it will be Ms. Toulouse Oliver to respond first. The question, Ms. Toulouse Oliver instituted the use of a barcode for voter information cards, meaning anyone can use that card at a polling place. How does the voting place know whether the barcode belongs to that voter? And the person goes on to say, this week 25 voters and received inf 25 voter information cards with barcodes on were sent to the same address, a, a restaurant in Northeast Heights. How does this help prevent fraud? So let me actually clarify something um, that my opponent just talked about. I think she was a little bit confused. I spoke of something called the electronic, or excuse me, the Election Verification Network, which is a national organization that works on election integrity issues. And what, what she began to talk about is actually something else. It's called the Electronic Registration Information Center, also known as ERIC, which we have entered into as a state uh, pursuant to a vote that was taken unanimously in the state legislature. My opponent sponsored, or done didn't sponsor but voted for that legislation and the governor signed it and now we have an opportunity to use the tool of sharing data with other states and within our state to improve the accuracy of our uh, voting rolls which is something that every single county clerk cares about county clerks are responsible for maintaining our voting rolls and county clerks and county boards of registration are responsible for making them more accurate now, in regard to the barcode question, my office has sent out a, an election information mailing prior to every election that I have overseen as county clerk. And the only difference with the letters that went out this time around is that as a voter, you are able to have your record pulled up more quickly so a poll official doesn't have to stumble over the spelling of your name or maybe uh, confuse you with somebody of the same name and, and we have a longer transaction time at the polls. The interest of the barcode is to increase the efficiency of the check-in process. Um, what we know is that the quicker we are able to check in a voter to get their ballot at a polling place, the shorter the line will be, the less time people have to wait. There's nothing otherwise new or different about this letter, and a voter has to give their state required voter information when they check in, and that um, is up to them pursuant to the election code, which they choose to give. Ms. Espinosa? Yes. In reference to uh, my opponent, very clearly stated that a clerk is to supposed to very clearly make sure um, that these voter rolls, isn't that what you said, are cleaned up and looked at? Well, she is currently the county clerk of Bernalillo County. She sent out these barcodes, and they're being sent to people 25 in one location that you heard, um, that people are not living there. It was a restaurant. Then... I received a letter from a gentleman by the last name of Polito, who received three. And wasn't the, wasn't the, the rolls supposed to be cleaned up? Wasn't it the, those that have been deceased removed? And wasn't it presently or currently, three years ago, to prove her point, that, to prove to her that there was voting fraud, they brought to her someone, looked at the newspaper, and went and asked for these um, absentee ballots and showed her that it could be done illegally. Did she do anything about it two years ago? No, now she has decided to do something about it because she's running for Secretary of State. Thank you. Ms. Toulouse Oliver, do you care to elaborate? <laughs> Um, unfortunately, I think my opponent has a little bit of difficulty getting her facts straight. Um, the reality is that uh, these, voter, these voter information letters that went out this time around are, are really no different from any other voter information letters. We work very hard in Bernalillo County to try to provide information to voters about how, where, and when they can cast a ballot. And we do this voter information letter. We're one of the only counties in the state that does it, but there are a handful of counties that do things that are similar because we share the values and where we have the resources available, uh, we try to educate our voters and make sure that they have voter information. Um, unfortunately, I think 
my opponent is a little bit confused about the extent of the laws and the abilities that we have as county clerks to maintain the accuracy and integrity of our voter registration rolls. We can't r randomly and haphazardly remove people from the rolls because we want to make sure that we're preserving the right to vote of every eligible citizen. We have to do it in a very methodical manner and with it, the information available to us, and, and that's what we do. Ms. Espinosa, would you care to elaborate? Yes, it is amazing how um, my opponent really doesn't get it. Voter ID is essential to all of this. Voter ID protects every citizen, eligible citizen, to vote. What she doesn't get, she went to the Democratic Convention, they had to show ID so that they could get their packets to be able to vote. What she doesn't understand this is about the integrity of the process. And if we're talking about the integrity of the process, we need voter ID. We need to make sure to protect the sanctity of each individual vote. That's what she doesn't get. And what about her 125 absentee ballots that were found unopened and uncounted after the canvas was turned in? That means 125 of your votes were of no value. Is this what we want? Can I, can I respond to that, Mr. Warren? Okay, thank, thank you. you. We, there was a voter ID question later here in the, in the uh, list, but <laughs> since you already raised that, let's go ahead and ask uh, Ms. Toulouse Oliver to give us her views on voter ID. Sure. Well, first and foremost, I, I want to make it clear to everybody here today that I support and have supported in the past any legislation that enhances the integrity of our election process, but not not at the cost of disenfranchi disenfranchising otherwise eligible citizens to vote. And the unfortunate fact, if you look at the variety of states across the nation that have passed strict photo voter ID laws, such as the type of law that my opponent supports and, and even sponsored in the legislature earlier this year, the day after she filed for Secretary of State, what you will see is that these laws are being struck down around the nation. And they're being struck down in very costly litigation that we as a state uh, in a in a budget crisis cannot afford to do right now. Uh, the truth is that these laws are being designed in a discriminatory way to prevent people from voting. And anywhere between 10 to 12 percent of the population, uh, studies have shown, do not have the kind of ID necessary. So if we want to protect the integrity of the election process, if we truly want to protect every single eligible citizen's right to vote, the government cannot be passing laws to take those rights away from voters. Ms. Espinosa, we'll give you the 60-second uh, elaboration period. Sure. Here again, she doesn't get it. Rhode Island, a representative, a Democratic representative, went to go vote in Rhode Island. She could not vote because someone stole her vote. Then the Democratic Party got furious because she says, we are going to pass voter ID laws. She went against her uh, political platform because she did what was right. Ladies and gentlemen, this is about doing what is right. And then to say this enfranchise, excuse me, this is about let's, let's please hold the applause. About disenfranchise. Yo que soy hispana. I'm an Hispanic. To me, it's insulting to say que yo no tengo la habilidad de conseguir una tarjeta. Any, every bill that's been introduced is for you to get a free ID and to say because I'm Hispanic or a minority that I'm inept to get a, a voter ID card. That is absolutely insulting. And this is where, and that it discriminates, this is wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, this is just to protect the sanctity of each individual vote. Voter ID, and, and by the way, 75% of New Mexicans support voter ID. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Toulouse Oliver, uh, 60 seconds, if you care to elaborate on this issue. So again, I, I fully support any legislation that can do two things enhance the integrity of our election process, but also protect and preserve the right of any eligible citizen to cast a ballot. I take the protection of each individual's right to vote very seriously. I have overseen elections in this county for almost 10 years, and I can't tell you how much it breaks my heart to see individuals who missed a voter registration deadline or who aren't actually registered in my county, they're registered in another county, but they're so excited to come and vote and they can't. They have to essentially vote a provisional ballot and not participate. 
Um, we already have so many hurdles to the ballot box. And when you look at what those hurdles are producing, what you see is something like the election turnout in 2014 here in New Mexico, where less than four out of 10 voters participated in the election. That is not what democracy should look like. Democracy should encourage and foster voter participation across the spectrum. Um, my opponent is sadly much more interested in keeping people from vote than encouraging people to participate in our democracy. Thank you, we'll move on to our next question and it will go to Ms. Espinosa first. A common cause calls movement of campaign funds between PACs a shell game. As Secretary of State, how would or could you address that issue? You know, that is an excellent question. My opponent, Common Cause, calls moving money from pack to pack to pack to pack. That's what my opponent does. Her treasure was, it was not online. We had to go look at it in files to find out that her treasure is the treasure of six different packs. And that has not been disclosed. And when we talk about, um, I need to go back and vote of participation, did she not, my opponent, close? We had, I think it was about, and I'm not sure, and you can correct me, about 260 different places where they could vote. Was it about 260 or 360? It was 172. Well, it was about 260 because she's bringing it down, yes. And now, 69, 69 places to vote. And then passing this, this barcode, but going back to common cause and what we need to do. We need to have transparency, and all this needs to be online. We should be able to track all, the, all these, these, these uh, treasures. Everything should be online. I should not have to go to the Secretary of State's office and look at it on paper. It should be clear and transparent online. And Common Cause was right when they said our opponent packed to pack to pack and George Soros money. Um, I mean, so we, those things need to be clarified. Those things need to be transparent. Thank you. Ms. Toulouse Oliver? Well, <clears throat> try to, there's a lot, of, a lot of things that were thrown out in that last one, a, a lot of um, catchphrases. But let me speak first to transparency, which I think is absolutely essential for our state and our democracy moving forward and should be the primary goal of the next Secretary of State in New Mexico. Um, we do have a campaign finance information system that uh, does not provide full, robust, easy to understand information about campaign finance in the state of New Mexico. When candidates and PACs and political organizations file campaign reports, you do often have to dig through reports uh, to find things. And uh, it is my intent to make sure that we have a new system uh, that is very functional, very user-friendly, and extremely transparent and provides a wide variety of information so that we as voters know and understand how we're and when money is coming and being spent in our elections in New Mexico. Ms. Espinosa? Yes. Um, I love when my opponent says transparency. Why did she not disclose her salary from UNM on her financial disclosure? I why don't was work that? For UNM. Why was that not disclosed? <laughs> I don't work for UNM. I you haven't know? for years. <laughs> um, go online, part time. It's right on there. Look at it. But, anyways, you can say whatever. What about? She talks about transparency. What about missing the deadlines? Sending our absentee ballots to our military men and women. Miss that deadline. That's transparency? That is not. What about the 125 absentee ballots that were unopened and uncounted? Thank you. Ms. Toulouse Oliver? Um, so we were talking about campaign finance. Um, all of my campaign finance information has been fully disclosed and it's available for anybody to look at. We do need a better system so that voters and people who are interested can better filter and digest that system. And that's something that I fully support and will undertake as Secretary of State. Um, in terms of the other situation um, that my opponent is describing, she's actually completely falsely describing a situation that occurred several years ago in which my office discovered an error that had occurred in the absentee counting process, immediately took action, notified the Secretary of State's office that ballots had gone uncounted, and petitioned to have them counted in the final state election totals that were certified, and they were counted and were certified. 
Being an election administrator doesn't mean things go perfectly. Elections are not a perfect process. What you have to do is when problems arise, you have to address them immediately and take responsibility and do everything in your power to fix them. And that's what we did. That's what I've done as county clerk and what I will do as secretary of state. Just for point of clarification, could you clarify the, the University of New Mexico issue that was... I, I, I have in the past uh, worked as a temporary part-time faculty with the University of New Mexico teaching political science classes. I have a master's degree in political science. I haven't taught a class at UNM since 2011. Thank you. Moving on to our next question. What does New Mexico law say about straight party voting, ticket voting? And what are your views of it? And I believe we start with you, Ms. Toulouse Oliver. Sure. Well, in the past in New Mexico, um, voters had the option to select a straight party option at the top of the ballot. And what that basically meant was for uh, candidates of major parties, qualified major parties, uh, a voter could elect to uh, fill in a bubble and therefore, by, therefore vote for every candidate of, of that party up and down the ballot, or uh, they could fill in that bubble and then maybe vote across party lines in individual races uh, for state representative or judge or, or whatever. And the great benefit of having a straight party option on the ballot, as most of you know, because we've now had uh, paper ballots in New Mexico for 10 years. Um, and even for me, even for somebody that runs elections for a living, um, it takes a long time to fill out a ballot. It's, an, it's a, a long process, and especially for people who maybe it's hard to stand a long time or hard to read the little print that, you know, our ballots are getting more and more full, having a straight party option really streamlines and makes it much easier for voters to cast a ballot. So I do support that. I do think that it was removed uh, specifically to make voting more difficult um, for people. And what we've seen as a result is so many more races down the ballot. It's, you know, it's harder for folks um, to maybe make it all the way through the process. And we have very important issues on our ballots um, that voters sometimes don't get the opportunity to cast a vote for. So I view straight party voting as a, a mechanism to make it easier um, and, and quicker for voters to cast a ballot. And, and like everything I do, I try to make uh, voting much easier and more convenient. Ms. Espinosa? Um, yes, and your question was on straight party uh, voting, but I must say this. My concern is not to make things easier, and I don't want to make it more difficult. My number one issue is the integrity of the process. The integrity of the process is first. That is what, but straight party, straight party voting, okay, that was a law that was passed by the House and the Senate. So it is up to the House and the Senate to revisit that law and if they pass that we change it, then we abide by that law. But if they do not change it, we don't abide by that law. We continue and we do what is currently said. We must be focused on the law. Just because I, I'm elected Secretary of State, and whether I like it or not, I choose to do what I believe, like two other Secretary of States did in the past, not following the law. This is absolutely wrong, and this is what's wrong with our state, that we have Secretary of State or clerks that don't follow the law, excuse it, find their nice words so that they can um, cover up what they're doing. Ms. Tillis Oliver? So I think here's the big difference, and we're really starting to see it on display here today. Um, my opponent thinks that election integrity and removing barriers to the ballot box are mutually exclusive. You can't have election integrity if you're trying to make voting easier and more convenient. You absolutely can. And you have to work every day as an election administrator, and I, I know this because that's been my job for the last almost 10 years, to strike that balance between providing voters an opportunity, um, but at the same time making sure that we have full, robust transparency and other mechanisms in place to protect the integrity of our election process. Election integrity is not just about something like voter ID. It's not just about checking who's coming into the polls. Voter, election integrity is about so much more than that. It's about establishing chains of custody to protect your voting systems. It's about having transparency to make sure that the public is able to watch the process. It's about so much more than just voter ID. Ms. Espinosa? Well, it's amazing how my opponent forgets that when she went to these convenience centers, the 69 convenience centers, 
What happened? Longer lines. Longer lines. So people went home. They didn't vote. When she's talking about integrity, it's like a foundation. How can you build a house if the foundation is not there? Do you just do the walls and forget the foundation? The foundation of this process is voter ID. Once, that, once you have an honest system, ladies and gentlemen, people, it's people, once they see that the system is honest and fair for all, whether you're a Republican, Democrat, or independent, they will turn out. And it's not making it more difficult, as my opponent said, not at all. It's just like going to the bank. You have to show your identification so no one will steal your money. We don't want anyone stealing our vote or getting extra uh, barcodes so that they can go down there with no identification. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, interesting question. Uh, in, in New Mexico, it is legal to open carry firearms and to carry firearms with conce concealed with a permit. Should it be legal or illegal to carry firearms in or near the polls? And I believe that one goes first to Ms. Espinosa. Yes, thank you. At this uh, point, I'm running for Secretary of State. That's up to the legislature and whatever the legislature decides. Thank you. Ms. Toulouse Oliver. I mean, clearly guns should not be allowed in the polling place. There is a provision in our election code that allows election officials, including uh, poll officials or the county clerk, to uh, ask for the assistance of law enforcement if there's ever a situation where um, a voter's ability to cast a ballot is being obstructed or, or whether um, there's some sort of uh, danger uh, to the voters in the polling place. Um, that's really the only time in my belief that, you know, guns should be allowed near a polling places when they're in the hands of a, of a law enforcement officer that is uh, undertaking their duties. Any elaboration, Ms. Espinosa? No. No, thank you. Well, speaking of things in the polling places, uh, we have a, a question here that says, uh, should you be elected, would you permit copies of the League of Women Voters Guides in the polling places? And that would go first to Ms. Toulouse Oliver. <laughs> Well, this is something that, um, as, as many of you know, uh, I had a disagreement with the former Secretary of State in regard to. Um, and my personal belief is that the League of Women Voter Guides are voter information. They are nonpartisan, they're bipartisan, they provide information for every single candidate, for every single question on the ballot. As a voter, and again, voting something I know a lot about, I work on it every day. I use the League of Women's Voter Guide uh, to make sure that I'm fully educated about the candidates on the ballot, about especially about the questions of which there are many. Um, I will let you all know in this year's ballot, for those of you who've not yet voted, um, I would encourage you to look at the League of Women's Voter Guide. I would love to be able to provide those in the polling places, um, and hopefully we'll be able to do that in the future. Ms. Espinosa? Um, yes, and you know that question when you have as my opponent the majority of her, a lot not the majority a lot of her supporters are from women league voters um, I think that we need to keep Anything I someone might think the women league of voters. I mean they're bipartisan and some might not we can have other entities coming in No, when you go to vote if you want to have information, put them, put them like they do those penny newspapers, every supermarket, every, people can get them everywhere, put them everywhere, but it doesn't need to be at the voting places. It does not. I am totally opposed to that, um, and that's where I stand. Do you care to elaborate, uh, Mr. Lewis Oliver? Yes, I think my opponent has said many times here on stage today that She's not in favor of making it easier for people to vote or educating them or providing them with information. She's opposed to mailing out voter information letters to voters. She's opposed to making a nonpartisan voter guide available in polling locations. She wants to erect barriers to the ballot box, make it harder, drive our voter participation numbers down even further, prevent eligible citizens from casting a ballot. Is this what we want as our next Secretary of State? Somebody who is so bound and determined to limit voter participation in New Mexico, to make it harder to not provide voters with information, to not educate them about our issues. I disagree. 
I believe in New Mexicans. I believe in the voters of this state. And I want to see every single eligible voter come out to the polling place and be fully educated about the decisions that they're making. That's why I'm running for Secretary of State. And that is what I will do as your next Secretary of State. Ms. Espinosa? Yes. You know, I believe in this great nation. I love this state. But one of the things I'm very clear that my opponent says that she's wanting everyone and, and for elections and for them to vote to have it made easier. And I will go back. I am for every eligible voter to be able to vote, but not to set up a process where there can be this voting fraud, where they can be this ineligible voters to vote. It's happening everywhere. It is happening. Lechuga Tena, an illegal immigrant, stated that she voted. You had a dog that she uh, registered. You had a, tw I mean, it goes on and on and on. And, and Sunland Park, over two dozen issues. Right now in Española. And we had Mr. Fernandez, that he could not vote. Why? Someone had voted in his place. Thank you. After the adoption of voting convenience centers for the 2012 and 2014 elections, did voter turnout increase? We have read stories about long lines, both here. There was a lawsuit in Rio Rancho uh, over um, long waits there. Uh, can you speak to that? And I believe we go first here to Ms. Espinosa. Yes, and thank you for saying that because, yes, it did. There were longer lines. It was not convenient. It, it's a great title, but it was not convenient. And voters had to leave. The lines were so long, they had to wait for hours. Voters should not have to wait more than 15 minutes. And there's less from 230 to 69 convenience centers. Ladies and gentlemen, if we're talking about making it easy, let's have the convenience centers everywhere. But to bring it down to 69 where these lines are long and people don't have the opportunity to vote because they need to get back home. So I'm in agreement. Yes, it was, and there was a lawsuit. Yes, it did come out in the newspaper. And yes, my opponent um, helped have longer lines. Ms. Toulouse Oliver? So actually, uh, voter convenience centers have been a wonderful tool to modernize the election process in Bernalillo County and to make it easier and more convenient for voters to cast a ballot. Uh, before 2012, when we first implemented voting convenience centers, we had 172 separate polling locations and we did move down to 69, but the beauty of the system is that even when we had more polling places, every voter in the county could only vote at one specific polling place on election day. Now, every voter in the county can vote at any of 69 locations. They can vote at the convenience center that's on their way to work, on their way home, maybe on their lunch break, and it has created a great convenience for voters. In fact, we work with the University of New Mexico Political Science Department that evaluates our election administration here in Bernalillo County every election. And what we have seen, what the data have shown, is that confidence in the election process has improved since we have been running elections this way and 92% of voters in the county said that they liked voting convenience centers better than the old way of voting. I'm very happy with it. Ms. Espinosa? Well, you know, if I have this great idea and I'm the one that's implementing it, of course I'm not going to point out the weaknesses. And there is weaknesses. And when you go and you have 69 convenience centers and where are they placed? While we had, according to my opponent, the 172, which it was, I think, 230, um, where people could go in their communities and go and know the people, and the people knew the people that went to go vote. So if the, someone was voting illegally, they would recognize, that's not Susie Taylor that's voting right there. They could recognize immediately, also because it was a community sense where they could go vote. But, you know, here again, she's very excited about her great ideas, but she's not willing to admit when they fail, when we have longer lines, when um, ballots are not um, being turned in, opened, and she stated very clearly, I must clarify that in the Roswell Daily Record, okay. that um, she herself quoted that um, the canvas was already closed and done. 
Thank you. Uh, let's turn to a, to a policy question. Uh, one of the uh, there's been a lot of discussion about primary elections and um, whether they should be whether primaries should be open either partially or fully. Uh, partial would be that independents are declined to state, which is about 20 percent in New Mexico, uh, could vote in one or the other party primary. This is a discussion nationwide in here. So I'd like to, I'd like to get both of your uh, views on that, and I believe we start with Ms. toulouse -Holler. Thank you. So um, this is actually an issue that I've personally come around on. Uh, I used to be completely opposed to people being able to participate in primary elections if they weren't registered in a specific political party. And over the years, I've now run five primary elections in Bernalillo County. And I have to tell you, it's really hard to watch people who are excited about the election, who want to have a say in who the nominees will be on their general election ballot, especially when so many races are decided in primaries. Uh, we have a number of districts across the state of New Mexico where it's a little bit lopsided in a partisan way. So the only real race for that office is a Democratic primary or a Republican primary. I want voters to be able to participate. I want everyone who feels strongly and passionately enough, who's eligible to, to vote, that comes to the polls to be able to cast a ballot. I want to see increased participation in our elections here in New Mexico. And I believe creating what's called a modified or, or a partial open primary here in New Mexico is the way to do that. If you're an independent or a minor party registrant and you come to the polls on election day, my opinion is that you should be able to pick a, a party to vote for their ballot uh, in that primary election. You shouldn't have to vote a provisional or be turned away from the ballot box. Ms. Espinosa? Yes. Um, great question. First of all, you know, the legislature, the House and the Senate, bipartisan, they pass bills. And the number one responsibility as a Secretary of State is to administer those laws. Whether I agree or not, and I understand that the election code also is um, not very clear on it. This would be something that the legislature, the House and the Senate, would need to pass for us then, or for myself as Secretary of State, to implement that, um, whatever that law is, in reference to um, these elections and to ensure that. But for the primary elections, I don't have a problem, but it's up to the legislature to clarify that, and then I will follow the law. Thank you. Ms. Toulouse Oliver? I, I think that's a great point. You know, the legislature is charged with making the laws that pertain to our election processes. And I and my fellow county clerks from around the state have worked tirelessly during legislative sessions over the last 10 years to help advocate for laws that will improve and modernize the election process in the state of New Mexico. So it's absolutely the purview of election administrators to come to our state legislature and talk with them and educate them about these issues and how it affects election administration. Um, so what I think is interesting is that my opponent's trying to say in, for certain issues that she doesn't really care to take a position on, it's, it's in the legislature's hands what they should do. But when it comes to voter ID, that's, that falls into the same category. I think it's really important that we recognize that the, the Secretary of State, as the Chief Elections Officer in the state, does administer the elections, will carry out the laws as passed by the legislature, but also has something to say, and the ability and the right to help educate the legislature about what they think will be best to make our election process as good as it can possibly be. Thank you. Ms. Espinosa? Um, when it comes to voter ID, that's the integrity of the whole process. It is extremely important. It's extremely important that we take and that we understand that without that, our system will never be fair and honest for all. It will not. And that is the reason. Um, and when it has to do with elections, the outcomes of elections. So to take a stand on that is very, very important. And, and I, my opponent said, well, you know, um, she decided to um, take legislation now that she's running or present legislation now that she's running for Secretary of State. That is not true. It's amazing how she doesn't understand the process. You don't have to carry a bill to be part of the bill. You can sign on to the bill to help the bill um, and move the bill forward and have your voice heard even if somebody else is presenting it. So when it comes to integrity, when it comes to elections, we must go back and we must support voter ID. And to increase participation, you increase participation when people believe that the system is honest and fair for all. 
Thank you. Um, next question. What, what would or could you do to improve voter access for rural areas and people with disabilities? And we'll go first to Ms. Espinosa. Okay, to improve? Voter access for, for people in rural areas and people with disabilities. Okay, well, especially with people with disabilities, it's just not in rural communities. I mean, um, we need to help them wherever they are as far as that is concerned. Um, and in the offices, and I know that the parties, it's an, part of the party's responsibility too, to be helping with that and getting that voter turnout and bringing them forward. Um, so to exclude that it's just the rural communities, I think that um, we need to do it statewide, help them out because we, their vote counts, their vote is important. So. Ms. Toulouse Oliver. I believe that that is probably one of the great challenges that the next Secretary of State in New Mexico is going to face. How do we create a more equally accessible system for voters across the state of New Mexico? Here in Bernalillo County, no voter is more than two miles away from the nearest voting convenience center. Here in Bernalillo County, we have ample early voting opportunities. So if you don't want to have to wait for election day for a particularly popular election such as this one, you don't have to stand in, a, in an extremely long line. You have a lot of options available to you, but voters in rural communities and tribal communities especially and voters with disabilities do have more challenges available to them or more challenges that they face in regard to casting a ballot. So I want to look for ways that we can expand access in rural communities, including uh, increased potentially mobile early voting. I think New Mexico eventually down the road could potentially adopt an all uh, vote by mail system such as they have in Oregon um, and other states. Uh, it, it, Colorado, for example, has a really wonderful system that we could look at to increase accessibility. Uh, and that could make it easier for every voter to cast a ballot. Ms. Espinosa. Here again. Uh, vote by mail. Who's voting? No voter ID. Who's voting? There has to be a different system. I'm in agreement to find a system that will work, but to send them in by mail? And uh, we know that voter fraud, the majority of our voting fraud, occurs in absentee ballots. You had in Chavez County a woman that, did, um, that voted for her three children who were already gone in college. And so when you talk about vote by mail, it seems unbelievable how my opponent goes back with all these great ideas, but yet will not focus on the integrity of the process, the integrity of each individual person, the sanctity of their vote. That is what is at stake here. So we don't have all these barcodes and we don't have all these dead people voting or them being sent to a restaurant, 25 of them, so that they can go and vote because they don't have to show an identification. Thank you. Ms. Toulouse Oliver? Well, <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I, I believe that, again, election integrity is about so much more than just showing voter ID. In regard to absentee voting in particular, uh, voters have to provide some personal identification information on an absentee ballot application, but something like a photo voter ID law, such as my opponent supports wouldn't solve the alleged problem that she's talking about. If we're really concerned, and I personally am really concerned, about people taking advantage of our election process, breaking the law, committing felony violations of our election code, we need to take that seriously. We need to make sure that law enforcement is having a zero tolerance policy. We as election administrators need to have a zero tolerance policy when it comes to referring those cases and I believe they should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. That's what I believe and that's how we can combat those issues. Thank you. We'll do one more question before we go to closings but before we, we do I want to thank our timekeepers, uh, Bert Berez and Charles Brown. So thank you very much, John. Bert said he was a first-timer, so cut him some slack. <laughs> he did good. Uh, you're welcome. The integrity of the Office of Secretary of State must be unimpeachable. What have you done as a public servant to further transparency and raise the standard of ethics in government? And that goes first to Ms. toulouse -Alt. Well, when I came into the county clerk's office almost 10 years ago, um, unfortunately, Bernalillo County had suffered a series of elections that were, were marred by 
you know, problematic election administration. So the first order of business when I came in was to make sure that we were creating an election process that ensured integrity of our voting systems, our ballots, our uh, voter registration information. And we developed and put down on paper processes uh, that you know, we still continue to improve and make changes to, but to this day hold up. They are transparent processes. Uh, we have an election process where any individual can come in and observe how we uh, certify voting machines to make sure that they are counting the ballots correctly. Uh, we are able to allow people to observe our poll official training. We are able to provide people who come in and observe our absentee counting process with all the information they need to understand what's happening. That type of transparency is how you increase the integrity of the election process. Getting results out on election night in a timely manner but with accuracy is also really important because voters can then have faith uh, in the outcome that they're, uh, of the election. So we have done a variety of things in the county clerk's office but truly and almost most importantly, making sure that every eligible citizen has access to the ballot box and has their vote counted, their vote counted as cast is the best thing that we can do to ensure that integrity. Ms. Espinosa. Thank you. Here again, we must do everything within our power to make sure that each individual vote is counted and only those that are eligible voters vote. And here, as Secretary of State, my opponent talked about transparency. She talked about accuracy. Accuracy, 125 ballots, unopened and uncounted. She talked about uh, prosecution. Um, we have Lechuga Tena, who was an illegal immigrant. She never did one thing about it. It was right in her office in, in Bernalillo County, not one thing. What she says and what she does are two different things. Um, and when we talk about the accuracy of the process, you can come and see anything. You can come and see the machines. But if that person is not an eligible voter, that's the issue. That is the issue. That is the issue of integrity. That is in, uh, the issue of protecting everyone, the sanctity of the whole process. Ladies and gentlemen, if we don't get that right, no matter what we do, it will not be right. Thank you. Mr. Liz Oliver. Um. My opponent has brought up several times the case of Ms. Idalia Lechucatena, who is a soon-to-be former state representative here in New Mexico. Um, when she registered to vote as a non-citizen, although not an illegal immigrant, I'm not aware, um, that was before my tenure as clerk, and I, I had no idea that she had done that until shortly before she was appointed to the state legislature by the county commission, and in that very moment, I referred that situation to the district attorney's office here in Albuquerque and let them know about it. Um, now, I was informed subsequently that the statute of limitations had passed, but this is the responsibility of election administrators. When you are made aware, when I am made aware of a credible allegation of election fraud or of individuals violating the election code, we have to get law enforcement involved. We have to get them to investigate and when warranted to prosecute to the fullest extent of the law. That's what I have done as county clerk. That's what I will do as your next secretary of state. Ms. Espinoza. You know, it is, it's, here we go. It is amazing. There's a saying in Spanish, entre el dicho y el hecho hay un gran estrecho. Between the saying and the doing, there's a long stretch. You know, our opponent at this time going back to integrity, going back to the process, going back to, uh, to all of this. Here we have, you know, who was it? Lara, Lara who falsified, her attorney falsifying documentation on the campaign finance, on mine, removing information, sent. Was anything done? Did she stand up and do anything? She's the clerk. Did she say anything? Oh my goodness, and it was proven that the form was redone, that the information on this form was fabricated and when it was turned into the, to the Secretary of State's office. But did she do anything about it at all? She stayed quiet. She didn't stand. She didn't prosecute, just like she didn't um, prosecute. And she said she didn't know, know about Lechuga Tena. Uh, I know for a fact that they were friends. And here she said she didn't know. And she was the one that took care of Lechuga Tena. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go to closings, uh, this, uh, this debate will be rebroadcast on KANW 89.1. When will that be, Michael? Yes, uh, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, 89.1. Mm -hmm.
Michael Brasher from KNW 89.1 uh, tomorrow night at 10. So feel free to tune in and relive this if you like. Uh, before we go to closings, I apologize to the audience for having my back to you for the last hour and some, it, but it does show I have some faith in humanity, or at least congregation. Uh, and, and I want to thank the congregation, uh, Congregation Albert, for doing this. It's a great tradition. So we'll, we'll let candidates sum this up. And uh, Ms. Espinosa, you have two minutes to wrap this up for the audience. Thank you, and thank you, audience. We are in a time in history where we are facing um, serious decisions in the direction where our state is going to go, where our nation is going to go. But ladies and gentlemen, that decision will be cast at the ballot box. If that, if it is important to every single one of us, just like preserving and taking care of our bank account, making sure no one steals our money, it is important that we focus and make sure that no one steals our vote at that ballot box. We need someone who will stand for integrity and fair and honest elections. I am Nora Espinosa, and I can say this to you today. I will. I will stand and protect your vote, the sanctity of your vote. My opponent can say whatever she wants. The proof of the pudding is, as we talk about all the 125 absentee ba ballots, not um, sending to our military men and women their absentee ballots. And it goes on and on and on. And about her staff and her treasure, pack to pack like Common Cause says, we need to stop this, who's also a treasure for six other packs. And when you go further on, and then in Española, there's an incidence also of voter fraud. So I come to you today, and I say, if you want honest and fair elections for all, I stand here today to ask for your vote, because my number one focus is on the integrity of the electoral system, that your vote is protected, that your voice is protected, whether you are Republican, Democrat, or independent. I, am, I will stand to protect your vote and the integrity of that process. And I thank you, thank you all, and thank you for having us. Ms. Tillis Oliver. Thank you. Well, thank you again, Mr. Waltz. Thank you again to the Brotherhood, to Congregation Albert, and to my opponent uh, for being up here with me today so we can have a discussion about this important office and the issues that surround it. And I think as we leave here today, I, I think you'll see that there is a stark difference between my opponent and I and, and the future that I believe we can have in the state of New Mexico and the health of our democracy in creating a system of voting that encourages and fosters voter participation, that helps to educate voters, that urges them, that tells them your voice matters. Your government should look like you and be responsive to you. And it can only be that way if you come to the polls and you share your voice with your elected leaders at the polls. That is the cornerstone of our democracy. That is a core value that I hold, that I've held as county clerk in the largest county in the state for almost 10 years, and that I will hold every single day as your next Secretary of State. I think it's really challenging in this particular election year because we have been inundated with uh, so much negativity and, and so many hurtful things being said by candidates across the board. And, you know, I would like to try to evoke the words of our First Lady who said, when they go low, we go high. My opponent, unfortunately, does not have anything to talk about when it comes to her experience, and she chooses to talk about things that are just factually untrue when it comes to my record. I think, and I am very proud of my record as county clerk here in Bernalillo County, we have modernized the election process. We have made it easier for people to vote. We are working every single election to try to improve on what we did the last time and make it better. That's what we need as a Secretary of State, somebody who's working every day to make it better for the voters of New Mexico. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nora. Thank you, and that concludes our debate for today. Thank you to the candidates.